So welcome back to Beating Alpha. We have another special guest and another special episode. This is episode 137 and we have uh, Powell Chi. So again, backgrounds and the things that he's working on and the things that he did. I mean, there's pretty incredible things here in the bio that I'm go we'll, co we'll be covering. So he's a multifamily and self storage investor and he runs several businesses as well. He leads the global networking community called Multifamily Masters that, of course, you can find on the website called the same multifamilymasters.com, uh, and he, which is the fastest growing multifamily meetup in the universe. I mean, it's written That's here. That's what I like I to say. Uh -huh. say yeah. I think it's written here. In just two you said half, it. You said it, so it's real. Okay. <laughs> here you go. It's reality. In just two and a half years, they have grown from one meeting uh, of eight people in a hotel lobby in Los Angeles to a, a membership of over 10,000 people across 60 plus locations in the US and one in Hong Kong. So again, there's gonna be interesting conversation about that. So Powell lives in Los Angeles, but um, all of his investments are out of state. Altogether, he's a general partner owner on over 1,000 apartment units in cities such as Indianapolis, Dallas, Jacksonville, Atlanta, San Antonio, and Phoenix. Currently, he's under contract to close on his first self-storage facility, a 175-unit, 20,000-square-feet property in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. At this point, he still has a full-time job as well. And of course, you can get in contact with him on Facebook, IG, and LinkedIn. So, uh, how I just want to say big thank you for joining me today on this episode. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Martinez. Appreciate it. Happy to be here. That's no problem. I mean, there's quite a lot of things here to cover. As you see, like you got me winded a little bit. I mean, for all this bio that I have to read through. Yeah, but, <laughs> I appreciate but look, that. it is awesome. I mean, you accomplished a lot. Again, part of the multifamily masters group building the network of the people, which took again, as it was said here, from eight people to ten thousand people, sixty plus locations. So it's insane. Uh, so, but again, I would love to, you know, cover maybe your personal background. I mean, can you t tell us your personal story? How did you get involved with the real estate business? And, you know, how did you became, you know, part of, a, part of the membership group and how did you help them to scale, you know, to those type of levels? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I started uh, investing in, in real estate, purchasing my own uh, property was 2015, right? And at that time I, I was living in LA, so I still live in Los Angeles and I really, couldn't figure out a way to do it inside of California, right? I was like living in LA, parents are from the Bay Area, and I just really couldn't figure out a way to buy a house and be able to either fix and flip it, rent it out, or anything like that. That just really, just didn't really work out for me. I just couldn't figure it out how to do it. Um, but then I started quickly listening to a lot of podcasts and hearing um, ways that you could do it remotely. And that sort of turned on the light bulb for me when I thought, hey, you know what? I don't have to live in the same city where my property is. And that was just mind blowing for me. So 2015, I was able to purchase my first single family house in Kansas City, uh, still live in LA. And then quickly after that, it, it went really well and I was really happy with it, but I quickly just knew that I was not gonna be able to scale that method of, of doing it as fast as I wanted to. So I jumped into multifamily, it was my next purchase was a multifamily property. It was a 40 unit building in Indianapolis. And that was the first one that I did. And then about a year later, I did another one, a 60 unit uh, property in Indianapolis as well. And that one I did with a JV. So it was uh, me and about five investors. And then 2019, I got involved in about five, five different syndications all on the general partnership side. So those are the ones in cities of Dallas, Atlanta, Jacksonville, uh, Phoenix, and things like that. So I've been involved in purchasing things, uh, multifamily properties from by myself in a JV and also as a, a general partner on, on syndications as well. And so that's what kind of led me to, to starting the group of multifamily masters. And, and I actually started it after my first property, after my very first one. And I specifically mm -hmm. started it as a networking thing because I was at home doing a lot of this by myself and listening to a lot of podcasts and reading a lot of books, but I didn't know a lot of people that were doing it. And I am a person that likes to be out there and likes to uh, get involved with people, hear about what their successes are, what their failures are, but try to help people along. And when I'm, when you're just sitting in front of a computer and reading and listening to podcasts, you just don't have that connection with people as, as well. Right. So I formed the group to, in order to find out other people who are interested in multifamily, but who are also interested in investing outside of California. Because 
there was a lot of groups. There was a lot of real estate groups that I was part of and, and meetups that I was part of, but they just didn't focus on what I wanted to focus on. So that's what started the group um, about a little about three years ago. And then I started it. Mm. But that's very interesting. I mean, you took a little bit different approach. I mean, you already, because you know, like people that are joining, becoming part of the groups, and there's a lot of those on Facebook, again, you know, they're just joining those groups. They're not looking to create their own personal groups. They're joining because they want to leverage existing networks, uh, existing people, and build a relationship through there. But you kind of pursued and, you know, you, you, you went in pursuit and started to build your own personal kind of group and, and the network. But I mean, there's a lot of people, you know, they're building it, but they take it to, you know, whatever, 300, 1,000 people and they stop there, you know, because again, it's the business that they have to run. But you guys kept continue to build the group. So why have you put so much focus, focus and effort into building the group, you know, to the 60 plus locations? Sure. I mean, I mean, pretty quickly what you find out with multifamily is that it is really a, it's really a team sport, like we'd say, right? It's team sport. It's, you know, you could do one by yourself, but you're you're quickly going to find out that it, it is very taxing on you in terms of time, money, energy. You know, it, it takes a lot. So if you can divide those roles up with several people, you can scale up a lot faster and concentrate on what you're very good at. So um, for me, you know, forming this group of, um, you know, just multiple people that were all excited about the same thing that I was in was a way to me to find out other people that may have complementary skill sets, or maybe it's people that want to invest with me, or maybe it's, I want to partner with them on, on a different one of their projects. You know, it was really kind of open-ended, right? You know, it was really purely for networking. And then I, I started out with a little bit of education as well as, as teaching people how to evaluate deals. So I would say, Hey, you can get a deal from a broker, but do you know what to do next? What's your next steps here? And so I started teaching people a little about what's the next steps to, so that you can, you know, so that you can talk to a broker, but you can evaluate the deal and sort of just kind of nudge them along a little bit. And then quickly it started to grow. And uh, several, I started, you know, I started with one chapter, like we said, eight people just kind of meeting in a hotel lobby. And uh, probably my second or my third meeting over there in that hotel lobby, they basically kicked us out because we, <laughs> We weren't really buying anything. It was like, we were just in there and just hanging out in the lobby and, you know, buying a sandwich or two, but they were like, you, you guys got to buy more than this just to hang out in the lobby. <laughs> so we had to go find a place and we went to a different restaurant and things like that, but we just kind of grew from there and we grew to multiple chapters in LA. I would say within six months, we grew to three chapters. Uh, so three locations in LA. And then about a year after that, we grew to, I think it was nine, nine chapters in all in LA, all in Southern California. And then quickly after that, it blew up into like, I would say in the next three or six months, it blew up into like 30, 40, 50, up to 60, like pretty quickly after that. So, um, and that's when we started really kind of marketing out there. Hey, we have, a, we have already developed a way to help you out to create your own meetup, what we can do for you and what we can, you know, how you can be part of the whole organization and everything. Got it. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of information that you, you know, put out there with that, with that answer, but is there kind of the sauce? Cause everybody looking for the sauce, give me the sauce, give me the answer. Like two plus two equals four. Can you, is there a, like a formula to building, you know, like a successful meetup, just, just like you guys did. Yeah. I mean, so in terms of actual, just having one meetup, right. There isn't, I guess, for just having one or saying, hey, obviously you got to, you know, topic, you got to have certain things people are interested in, you know, you want to promote your uh, as as possible as well too. I wouldn't say there's a, like you said, you could start just like I did when we sat around the table and we all talked about what you're doing in real estate and what your interests are, right? Everybody had about five to 10 minutes to talk about what your interests are. And then we just, hey, let's meet again next month, right? And Pretty simple, but so you can start slide those you can start speakers, uh, have a series of talks and things like that. Call every just starting out. You can just start a small group of people and start out and just continue to be consistent and, and and it'll it'll grow. Now, in terms of how do you start multifamily masters the organization? That's a whole other thing. Now that does a lot of course work certainly 
involved. There's a lot of people, a lot of people involved um, that can help with that. And we can talk about that we did that as well. But um, but yeah, there are some major differences running the whole organization versus just one single meetup. Mm, okay, got it. So uh, again, like, what makes your uh, particular meetup group different from the rest of the people that having these meetup groups? Like, what is your differentiating like part? Still there? Okay. Yeah. Still there, Martinez? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Just just got disconnected here okay. for a second. So okay. can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Good, 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 good. Because th there was some connection issues here. But uh, the, the question that I wanted to ask you again, um, like, first of all, congratulations on, you know, 10K plus people and, you know, counting every single day. So adding more value to the more people with a meetup. Well, what would you consider again? Because there is, you know, quite a few different meetups out there, at least from my eyes that I checked, you know, before. So what makes you guys and your meetup like different from the rest that's out there? Sure. And um, I would say that with, when you have a large group and you can grow your group to say 60, 60 different locations like we have, you have a lot more power of connecting people that, uh, that would never connect before. So in multifamily, just like how I started, right? When you're starting to purchase, when you live in LA and you're starting to purchase in Kansas City or Indianapolis or Memphis, you may or may not know anybody there, right? But now that we have chapters that have, you, you may be in LA and we have a chapter in Birmingham, Alabama, and that's where you would like to invest because you, you maybe have relatives there, but they're not really into multifamily. Having a chapter there now helps you connect with people there that are either boots on the ground, or maybe they, they're gonna have a, a, something that you guys could partner on, or you can invest in their deals or something that connects you with people and you have a lot more of, a, of an interaction with them, whereas you may not have had that before. And it may be very daunting to think of, how am I gonna start a team there when I don't even know who I would start with, right? Do I start with a broker? Do I start with, you know, who do I start with? Whereas we can help source out those those people and um, and those connections, right? So that's really what, multi the, I guess, the big power of Multifamily Masters is, is that we're able to connect people all over the world in many different markets and and help you, um, you know, get some local knowledge of those local, of those particular markets, right? And since then, we have grown to having many people who there are very, very experienced. So they can, we have a lot of very experienced people inside the group and they can help out with, um, you know, just kind of uh, any types of advice or, or background experience where you can ask them. It may not be as specific to lo the location. It may be specific to, I'm finding this from my property manager, um, is everybody else seeing the same thing? And they may be able to give you a lot of uh, information back of, I would do it this way. I would, I would try this, maybe ask your property manager this, you know, they will give you a lot of advice. So mm -hmm. there's just a lot of power in the whole community and the, the, the ability to be able to connect with people and connect with other chapters who are in the same alignment as, as you are, it provides a lot of, uh, I guess, a lot of value, I would say. Whereas if you're just a chapter by yourself, if you're just a meetup group and you are, Boise, Idaho or something, and you're, you know, very strong in Boise, you know, you're not connecting with anybody else who's outside of the market, right? Yeah. And they're not connecting with you. So you could be very strong and you could run a very successful one, but you're potentially missing out on other investors or you're yeah. missing out on other partnerships that could help you if you want to invest in other places or other people want to invest in your, in your city. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, missing out on the opportunities, not connecting with other people in different states where sometimes that's where opportunities are. So, and yeah. of course that's happening. So, you know, can you share a story uh, of a people, as you said, you know, when they come together, uh, again, maybe from different states, but come to the meetup and they connect and make something happen, you know, do you have some stories that kind of stood out, you know, through, yeah. through all these two and a half years? Sure, sure. And I'll, and I'll give a personal one because there are, I thought about doing this before about finding out how many partnerships have actually connected through the group. And I don't think I have really a way of, of tracking that. I wish I really did. I, I, or I could, it would have to be sort of a manual process, but I'll give you a clear example of one just because it's personal, right? And so in my meetup group, when it was just uh, three chapters, three locations in the Bay, in, in LA, um, I used to hold held mine every, every month. And then one guy, he came to it, right? And his name was one. And one would come to my, my meetup 
and he started talking to me about what he's doing and and I was like okay cool and he and then we find out oh we're both interested in Indianapolis and he's purchasing some small properties I'm purchasing some some decent sized properties and and then we quickly started finding out hey we're we're actually looking at some of the same type of properties we're looking at this 30 unit building like he's looking at it and I'm looking at it and then he started sending me his underwriting and I was like okay that's pretty unusual for somebody to send you their underwriting and telling you, I'm going to bid on this property. This is my underwriting. And this is what I feel the value of this property is worth. And I was like, it's pretty trusting of somebody to do that. Cause most people get a little like, oh, I'm not sure if I want to send this to you because I don't want you to steal it from me. And I don't want you to do this. Right. So I thought, Oh, okay. This guy's, you know, he's very open. He's, he continued to send me more stuff. And he, and he started saying, Hey, you know, if you want to, you want to go for the property, you can too as well. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying that you, you can't go for it, right? And um, and then quickly I started saying, okay, well, here's my here's my uh, response to your underwriting. Here's here's what I think about your underwriting, and here's where I think that uh, you know we could talk about you know what what is a uh, wait hold on sorry one second here. Um, no worries. Okay, okay. Um, I'll get this worked. Sorry. Um, and so I started telling him, um, you know, just just kind of what I thought about the, the particular property and and what um, and his underwriting. And then we started sharing more and more. And then I started sharing some properties with him like, hey, here's a property. I, I think I'm going to actually um, I'm going to put in an offer on it. And here's what I'm going to put an offer in. If you're interested, maybe you can too as well. And so we started putting bids on the same properties and then pretty quickly we're like, why are we putting the same bid on the same property? Why don't, if you get it, you, you'll partner with me. And if I get it, I'll partner with you. So that, that way we don't have to really feel like we're competing against each other. So we went from competitors to partners really quickly. And then we've basically formed this partnership where we have been on together in those five different syndications. We've been, we've been um, partners on that and the self-storage uh, deal that we're working on right now where we are partners. He, he has since moved to Texas, so he lives in Dallas now, but uh, him and I uh, still continue to be partners and you know we remain partners right now. So hopefully that, that's an, uh, an example of like what can happen from just going to a meetup and you don't necessarily know that person at all. And then yeah. quickly, you, know, you form a relationship of, uh, of trust and then down the line, you form an actual partnership together, not just like one, we've partnered together on a property, but no, this is actually a partnership together that we have, that we're consistently doing. Yeah. Yeah. And that is awesome. That is a great story. And thanks for sharing. So the, the person that you're talking about, his name is, uh, Koa Pam, as far as I know, uh, his name is, his name is one, one oh, Yang. Oh, so w this is a different person I'm looking yeah. for. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry. There. Yeah. No worries. No but, worries. uh, Again, I want to I want to talk about the fact that your guys are spreading out again 60, 60 plus locations, uh, which is of course in the U.S. So covering probably all the states available, hopefully, and almost, uh, but not quite, but almost we're getting oh, there. Almost, almost awesome. So and now you're moving on to Hong Kong. So I don't know, are you still using the same name? Is it a multifamily ma uh, multifamily masters? Is there a, yeah. is there more multifamily deals available? Like, and why have you decided to move to Hong Kong? So what happens is we're, we're a very open group with us. And so what we do is we, we find chapter, chapter leaders, right? So the location leaders who are, who may be in any city in throughout the world and they're interested uh, in what we're doing. They, they've probably been to a lot of our, um, either our Zoom calls or they've heard us speak or they, they have some connection with us where they've um, heard us on a podcast. So in this case, um, I, Eddie, who is our chapter leader in Hong Kong, actually heard me on a podcast. And so he reached out to me and was, and was saying, hey, and talked to me about meetups and how does he start a meetup over there? And so I gave him some hints and, and told him, this is way, what I've done. And then I said, hey, if, if this is something that you're interested, we could probably help you out uh, on a, you know, significantly and have you be part of our group, right? And his, you know, I won't speak too much for him, but his idea was, not necessarily to buy and um, run property in Hong Kong was more of, hey, there's a lot of people in Hong Kong who probably want to invest in, in the US, right? And so he could be a conduit to that. Mm -hmm. And then that could be his, his major role is, is being a conduit to a lot of the Asian investors and being able to invest in the United States. Whereas mm -hmm. they, they might 
they might not know where to invest or who to invest with, right? Sure, they want to invest in the United States, but what's the difference between investing in uh, Carson City, Nevada in Dallas, Texas, right? There's a, probably a huge difference, but they don't necessarily have the time or, or, or knowledge of, of that, right? So, um, so that's, this that's, is kind of his way so to be So that's a little bit, so, sorry again, so that's a little bit of a strategic move right there, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, it kind of help, it helps all of us around, right? So everybody that's interested in his chapter that are, that are potentially interested in investing in the United States, that's certainly, he can be a, a great resource. You know, he can get on deals himself by doing that. And then us in the United States potentially have other investors that we would never have had a chance to, you know, make a connection with before, right? Mm -hmm. So what about, what about moving from there? Is there any plans maybe, you know, from strategic standpoint or just, you know, thoughts that you have in kind of branching out in, in you know, in, in the kind of deep East, you know, part of the countries, you know, like Japan, China, you know, Vietnam, mm -hmm. like any of these parts that you're looking to cover? Yeah, so I would say that we are not, um, at least at least right now, strategically, we're not saying like, we're gonna go out to those particular cities and place a chapter there because, we, what we want people to do is everybody who is basically has joined us has actually been either attendee or listened to or been a part of our group before. So they know our culture and they know who we are as a, you know, they know what we're like and everything. And we want those people to be, we want to continue that culture. It's super important in, inside of our, our organization to have the right culture, all right, yeah. the right people. And so we have, we in general have been, um, a little bit more of like, hey, we'll we'll help you if you want to. So if Sydney, Australia, if somebody was in Sydney, Australia, and they heard about us and they wanted to be part of us, and they uh, you know felt like a culture match would be it's a good culture match, then we would explore the idea of starting a chapter there. But we're not necessarily strategically saying we want to place one here, we want to place one there, we want to place one there because we don't know necessarily if we have. Um, if we have the right culture match and also if we have the right person out there to, to, uh, to run that chapter. Got it. Got it. So now we got the two. Now we got the answer. Now we start to get the answers for the formula, you know, now we got the two, <laughs> which is the, which is again, is, is having the, you know, this kind of, you know, system and business and, and in place and having the culture, you know, which is again, the, the, the it's, as you mentioned, it's a very important thing. And I, I mean, mm -hmm. if you're going to look at every big business or every big media, probably they have this one thing, which is a culture, you know, everybody feel like mm -hmm. they're welcome there and everything, you know, about them makes them unique. And, and again, your culture mm -hmm. is different from, you know, everybody else that's yeah. happening there. So again, this is two and we adding plus and of course, in a second part of the covering the bio, maybe we're going to uncover the another two sure. and we're going to get the, the formula right there. But I'll sure, I'll tell you one thing that is different about us than say sure. you're asking sort of what is different. Uh, we are a ground up kind of culture. So you're talking about culture. We are ground up. So we're grassroots. So we build from, say, the chapter leaders on up. So there isn't necessarily like a one where I would say other other meetups that have a maybe a multi multi um, state presence or anything. A lot mm -hmm. of times they're very top down. In other words, like they're driven by one person who dictates like the curriculum, what's said, you know, who's going to do this and who's going to do that, who, you know, it is very top down, right? So that person is the decider of, of everything that happens. Whereas we're a lot more gra grassroots and we're a lot more ground up where we, we let people uh, develop their own curriculum. We, we help them say like, this is what we've done before. This is what we're doing now, but you can do it the way that you want to. And so we, um, you know, we encourage people to have some creativity about how they're doing it. And all that creativity is just more powerful with everybody being creative and, and helping each other and, yeah. and having that sounding board rather than one person kind of saying, this is the way to do it. I want you all to do it this way, right? And so that's, that's a huge difference in, in sort of the, the, you know, the meetup groups, especially re real estate meetup groups uh, between us and other ones. I would say that's a big difference. In that, yeah. Got it. Yeah, that, that sounds like a big, big difference. And of course, like in, in that case, when I'm comparing different meetups and I, again, this type of scenario and the way you're running, the way you guys are running, because it's not only you who said, you know, like, like the top guy who runs the meetup. I mean, the way you guys and girls, you know, who are running the meetups, 
I mean, it sounds more, you know, compelling to me. And it sounds like I would like to join something like that more than, you know, somebody who stands on a, you know, on this high chair and just, you know, says like, yeah. you, you know, it's like one face instead of, you know, just, just, uh, again, a culture of people, you know, bringing yeah. everybody on the same roof with the, with the kind of same mission and same purpose. So it sounds a little bit more kind of, you know, compelling to, at least to me, and I'm, I'm sure to some more people who are watching this episode. So Appreciate that. Thank you. That's no problem. I mean, you guys are doing a phenomenal job. So before we're going to move on to your personal, you know, investment decisions and multifamily and the reason somebody should get involved with the business. Uh, last question that I would like to ask about the meetup, like, is there a number that you have or somebody have set up for the group that you want to scale, you know, to this, uh, to the end of the year? We don't have an exact number. You know, we were, um, I would say we were pushing something like anywhere from 75 some, somewhere around 75 is what we were thinking. However, we were starting to get to the point where we're, we realized that our expansion, uh, we needed to concentrate on our community that, that we do have rather than try to continue to expand out as far as possible. And also everybody was kind of reeling about how to do this all with COVID now, right? Because pre mm -hmm. previously it had all been in person. So they were talking all these meetups were in person and there, there was only a couple, I mean, like maybe, maybe one or two that were virtual. Right, and now everybody had to shift to virtual. So there's been a lot more of like, we need to concentrate on our community to help them move from in-person to virtual, how to, how to run, uh, you know, how to run that, how to combine chapters, how to, how to have different, um, you know, how to get guest speakers and things like that. So we, we really kind of scaled down the number of what we thought we were gonna try to get to and try to uh, hone in on, on making sure that our current, um, our current community is well supported. So, so I would say we started with maybe 75, but you know, we, we aren't really shooting for that number anymore. Or anything mm -hmm. like that. Makes a lot of sense, got it. So again, moving on to our personal part, again, living in Los Angeles still and investing out of state, like for me, it's kind of no brainer. Do you understand why you don't invest in, in, in Los Angeles? But, but for the people who are, again, not from there, same as I am, but maybe have no clue, what's wrong with the Los Angeles? Like why are you investing in other states? Yeah, I mean, when it, for me, it, it came down to like, it really came down to affordability, what cost, affordability really, right? So, and when I look at like numbers for me, um, it just ended up being that I thought that the numbers would work out better for, for my situation out of state. And also I would say a big part, a big factor in this is, um, is the laws, right? The California laws are a lot more, a lot more slanted towards tenants than they are in other states. Right. And so evictions, you know, timing of evictions and things like that just make it a lot more difficult in California. California also, you know, sort of um, has all these uh, uh, rent control, right? And rent control is not even thought about in other states, things like that. So in terms of for, for me, it's just ended up being that, hey, like I would pr preferably like to invest out of state also because, um, you know, when you, when you think about like investing two hours, two hours driving distance from you, okay, that in Los Angeles, that covers a lot of area. First, that covers a ton of area, right? But, um, but when you start to think like I can invest in anywhere that I can fly three hours to or three, you know, something like that, you start to think, well, not only am I covering all of LA and I certainly could invest in LA, but now I'm covering two thirds of the whole United States. So I don't need to be tied to any specific market. And that's, it's very kind of liberating. And I've told people, you know, that are in LA, I've said, hey, look, if you're in LA, would you invest in um, Las Vegas? And they're like, yeah, most people say, yeah. I'm like, okay, that's a four hour drive. Would you invest in Phoenix? Most people say, yeah, because they're comfortable with uh, Phoenix or Las Vegas. I'm like, okay, that's like an hour plane ride. That's like six hour drive, right? I'm like, now if you're willing to take a six hour drive, um, you, if you take a two or three hour plane ride, you're already talking about like you're covering 50 to 60% of the United States. So if you're willing to drive six hours back and forth every two weeks or every month to go to Phoenix, then what's the difference of taking a plane ride for two or three hours and be able to cover a ton of the United States, right? So for me, I just thought it, it just worked out better for me that I'd, I'd say, um, you know, invest throughout the whole United States. Yeah, again, makes sense. Yeah, and we can, you know, discuss a little bit more in, in operations and how do you, you know, manage all these properties remotely. But one question that I wanted to ask, again, thousand apartments, uh, you know, 
uh, under management currently in all these different states. So what's happening currently in your pipeline? I mean, are you actively looking deals beside, you know, what you're currently closing on? And of course we can talk about self-storage, but in multifamily, are you actively looking for deals? Yes, I would say that, although right now I've, um, since COVID, and, and this is what happened to me during COVID, I guess my story is that I, I really kind of put a pause on, on really actively trying to buy the same type of multifamily that I was before COVID hit, right? So it was, you know, pre pre previous to COVID hitting, you know, I was looking at, you know, a property that would get uh, over 15% IRR or something like that. And just, you know, maybe like a six year, you know, equity multiple, double your equity um, within that six year time period. So it's looking for properties that could perform like that for investors, right? And once COVID hit, I was like, wait, wait, with a lot of what's going on right now and a lot of question marks about, about laws, about evictions, about who's paying and, and about who's not and, and government assistance and things like that. I said, at this point, I don't want to buy the same type of properties that I was buying before. I only want to buy what I consider home runs. And to me, a home run and how I define it is something that I can confidently project that I am going to refinance this property within say three to four years and be able to pay my investors back with all their capital. Okay. So that's, I guess that's what I'd say is, is my, um, is my, my home run, right? Three to four years refinance and be able to pay back all my investors capital. And what I'm, from what I'm seeing in multifamily right now, I'm not seeing as many of those deals that happening right now. And, and I don't see them really happening to me. Right now, it doesn't mean that they're not happening and other people aren't able to do them. Um, but just for me, I just wasn't able to, I just wasn't seeing that many of them. So I started looking more into self storage and I, cause I knew I was pausing sort of on the, on the multifamily right now. And with that, I started focusing a lot more on self storage and started looking for properties. Were there properties that I could project um, to be a home run for me? And I found at least one and I'm hopefully finding more that, uh, that I'm thinking that are that are meeting that standard. Got it. So have you have you had a thought about you know investing in you know other asset classes? You know it's still it's still you know in, in real estate, but you know like uh, mobile home parks. Have you thought about that before moving into self storage, or you were confident mm -hmm. about investing in self storage? Yeah. So I would say that previous to say pre pre COVID and everything, I was ninety five percent multifamily, five percent I would spend a time looking at self-storage. It was my secondary, but I barely spent any time. Didn't really know how to do it. Didn't really, just liked it, but didn't really know how to evaluate it or how to yeah. actually purchase one or anything like that. Um, and then I stopped with the multifamily and then decided, okay, let me focus all that time now, 95% of the time on self-storage. And because it was already my secondary mm -hmm. sort of, I guess, asset class and felt good about it, um, I just kind of said, oh yeah, you know, I'm going to go forward with this and be able to, you know, kind of stick in this class that class. Now it doesn't mean I'm not looking at mobile home parks and everything, but I'm still on that. I'm looking, but I only know 5%. I don't really know how I would purchase this or what I would do. I, I'm sure I've heard, you know, things, but I just haven't gone through that process of really knowing how to evaluate it, knowing, like knowing the ins and outs of it. And so at this point, I would, I would not say that I am actively looking for anything, any other asset classes. Really, it's multifamily and self storage. At this particular time, you know, it's a heavier concentration on self storage than it is in multifamily. And it's good, you know, you you got rid of the two T's uh, from three, so that's the, yeah. the tenants and the termites, <laughs> uh, the tenants and the toilets. And you might yeah. still have a, a few termites, depending on how how old is the storage units. So sure. this particular deal that we're talking about, like 175 units, 20,000 square feet and Baton Rouge. So can you talk about what made you to choose this particular location? Is it the pricing? Is it location? Like what's happening in, yeah. in the area? Sure. And, and I guess my philosophy when it comes to picking uh, properties out of, out of state, right? Or, you know, first of all, it has to have um, the market demographics have to be there, right? So you, population growth, right? Is, there, is the population increasing or at least strongly stable, right? It doesn't have to be increasing significantly, but increasing um, job are jobs uh, coming to this area, right? You wanna find out how the jobs are doing. Is there job diversity? So that's probably number three, like what kind of job diversity is there, right? And then number four is really affordability. And so those are those four that I look at. And so it kind of checks off the boxes on all of them, right? Population growth, job growth, job diversity, Baton Rouge is 
is the capital of Louisiana. So it's, it's got, you know, it's, it's got the government, it's got the, you know, the university, LSU, it's a big school. Um, it's got uh, many other factors there. It's right on the, it's right on the uh, Mississippi River. So a lot of transportation and things. And then um, affordability, and, and it is a very affordable uh, project. So that's, that's what kind of led me to this, to getting this project. And um, yeah, I would say why, why I chose this area as well. Got it. So probably we, we cannot discuss this uh, deal in, in details because it's still under contract or we can, can we go into details? Mm -hmm. I mean, we can go into it. If there's stuff that I can't say, then I just won't say it, but I'll just let you know. But yeah, we, we can say it. Yeah, I got it. So, so what, what, what is the first, like, first of all, what year is it? Is it a brand new build or? 2005. So it's not, uh, I think it was built in between 2000 and 2005 was really the, the times where it was built in different phases, but yeah, 2005, I'd say the latest build. So what will be kind of the closing price? Uh, 675000 Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, so how is it's that? Not that much. How is that compared yeah. to the other markets that you looked at that you're currently actively investing in in multifamily? Yeah. So, I mean, when you look at multifamily. Um, no, if you're gonna look like, at the self storage, but let's say in those markets that you have the multifamily deals, how is that compared to Baton Rouge? It, it, it's probably significantly less, right? That that price the, when you look at like price per unit or price per square foot, which are, are your big, you know, determining factors in self storage. That that's um, you know, that's, it's significantly lower than it would be in Dallas, Atlanta, um, you know, other, other Phoenix and other markets like that. So. Mm -hmm. Got it. So, but yeah. again, we're talking about some of the markets that are mentioned here again, Dallas, very strong market, Jacksonville, strong market, mm -hmm. Atlanta, San Antonio, Phoenix. So these are kind of strong markets. So Baton Rouge, Louisiana, like, cause again, you talked about kind of looking at the demographics and what's happening with the job. So Who's like the, sure. main, the main driver when it comes to the employment? Well, I mean, the main driver for them is, is the state capital, right? So it's the state capital and then probably the, the school, the university is probably the second one, right? So those are the big two um, in terms of employment for, for Baton Rouge. Right? Got, it, got it. Okay. So when it comes to that particular deal, like, like when you're going to close it, what is going to be happening with that deal? Are you going to use the same syndication approach? Like uh, how, how are you going to go about with the deal? Yeah, I, I'll tell you this, that I've kind of moved from from the syndication approach to more of a joint venture approach, okay. right, where I'm, I and this property wouldn't be big enough really for a, a syndication anyway, right. Mm. But when you're looking at, um, like this type of property, and, and joint venturing right now I can, I can, I would say the reason why is, first of all, it's not big enough. But second of all, in, in joint ventures, and um, I would say there's, you don't have to go so like when a, uh, let me back up a little bit. In a syndication, you have the general partnership and you have the limited partnership, right? Your general partnership could be made up of, uh, you know, I don't know, six, 10 people, whatever it is. And your your limited partnership, depending on how much you raise, could be, you know, 70 people, you know, a $10 million property, it could be 70 people in that. So you're talking, you know, 80 people or so in this property. In a joint venture, it's a lot smaller, right? So you were talking, you know, seven people or something like that. Now, for me, my whole network of people is a lot more, um, is a lot more type, the type of people that are interested in investing as, as not just a passive investor, but they really want to learn. So mm -hmm. the people that I know really want to learn, they want to get experience, they want to be involved. They don't want to just put place their money, right? And so this is, the, this is just happens to be the network that I have, that I have right now. But they, these people also have some money and, you know, they want to be hands-on. They want to be hands-on. So this lends to me to be able to create a JV a lot easier because now I can say, hey, everybody is going to be actively involved. Everybody's going to have a, a vote. Everybody's going to be able to come with me when we go to the property. It's going to be able to listen in when we, when we talk to the property management and it's going to be able to get the reports. You're going to be involved throughout the whole, throughout the whole deal, right? And so... This is a lot more attractive to a lot of my network. Just happens to be that this is just what my network is, right? And I don't need to go out and get these big giant deals, right? And even still, I don't really want to, I don't really want to go in and try to start purchasing a six, five, six million dollar uh, self-storage property, not yet anyway, because you know, like I said, this is my first self-storage. I want to get some track record. I want to, you know, build up the track record, build up the experience. Um, do it with a small group of people first anyway. And then later on, I can start to figure out whether or not I really want to go into a syndication model. 
So there, there, there might be some syndication opportunities going ahead, but again, as you're saying, it's just a learning curve for yourself or a small group of people that they can get involved. So how do you actually underwrite a deal and what is the exit strategy is going to be for you for that deal? Sure. So, I mean, you know, in terms of a lot of the underwriting, you're going to ask for a lot of the same type of uh, documents, right? The T12, the rent roll, uh, things like that. But you need to be carefully aware of um, I, the major threat to self-storage and any self-storage facility is competition levels, right? And, it's, and you need to know what your competition level is like in your specific micro market. So not just the whole area of Baton Rouge, but specifically in that three or five mile radius from your, uh, from your facility, you need to know what the competition levels are like. And so um, that's a super important statistic that you need to get. Whereas in, in multifamily, that's not really that as, as important. And, um, and if somebody was gonna build a new multifamily next to your C-class property, it, it may not affect it as much because it's probably gonna be an A-class property or an A-minus class property and your C-class property is not exactly at the same competitor level. Whereas, Somebody that's building a new self-storage next to yours, even though yours might be C-class, um, you're gonna find, you're gonna fight for the same type of same type of tenants. You're gonna you're gonna run into some issues with that. So you need to know what your competition level is like. So that's one of the major things when it comes to the underwriting, right? Is just is knowing that is knowing that side. So in terms of exit strategy, you know, on our pro forma, we do the same thing that we do in multifamily, which is make a five-year projection, uh, a straight sale. So no refinance or no anything, just five year straight sale. What does it look like in five years? Um, however, are we going to actually use that as our exit strategy? Probably not. Cause like I said, this, this, we can confidently project that this, that this project will be able to refinance within say three to four years, like I said, and probably pay back all the investors capital. So that's what we're probably looking to try to do a lot more than just straight a five year straight sale. And everybody that's involved in the deal is is very comfortable with being saying, okay, we could refinance this and say year four, and we could hold on until till year ten, and then we could decide what we want to do at that particular point. We don't really need it. We don't really need a sale in five to six years in order to turn this money around. Got it. Got it. So we kind of covered, you know, when it comes to the particular number which we find out, there is no particular number for need of group. How much do you want to scale it until the end of the year? Is there a particular number for? Uh, for the storage units that you want to close on until the end of the year? Ooh, at the end of the year. I would like to, uh, I will shoot for one more. Mate, no, two more, two more. Two more by the end, of, under contract by the end of the year. So and is it going to be Louisiana goal. or is it going to be different markets? I'll tell you, after getting involved with this, uh, this, this seller, he actually said, hey, I have another one that you guys might want to take a look at. So hey, there's, maybe there's another one. Uh, but otherwise, it will be, you know, probably outside. You know, we'll look outside as well. Here we go. Here we go. That is awesome. I mean, there's a lot of things happening. First of all, I love the fact that you're building this meetup group, which is, again, the biggest in the universe, as we found yeah. out today. <laughs> no, it's really awesome. There we go. You know, everybody should get in contact uh, with Powell or better if you go to the multifamilymasters.com or Facebook or Instagram, you know, get in contact with this man because he, he will be available to answer a few questions when it comes to that and direct you to the right resources when it comes to learning about multifamily investing. So, I mean, what you're doing with the group, I mean, it's phenomenal, you know, helping a lot of people, Thank which you. is, you know, guiding them towards the right investment decisions, which again, you know, there's a lot of uh, wrong ones, you know, <laughs> hint, hint, you know, Wall Street. And, uh -huh. you, know, you know, they're not guiding people anywhere just to the, you know, kind of, you know, dead end. So sure. you're helping a lot of people. And again, what are you doing currently yourself? So kind of two questions that I wanted to ask you, because I think um, one of those questions will relate to the current situation is a lot of people maybe still in a position where they're having a full-time job and they, you know, uncertain what's going to happen with the future. And now they are looking towards maybe multifamily investing or same as you, you know, storage or mobile home parks. So how they should go about when it comes to starting their own personal real estate business and how do you manage that having a job? Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, first of all, if you're just starting, you really need to get educated, right? So you need to listen to the podcast like yours, Martinez and other podcasts or read forums and other books. But certainly when it comes to like, how do you balance, how do you balance your, your work life? You know, I would, for me, one of the major things that I did and, and, and continue to do is, is that you got to wake up early and be productive and you got to. So I learned that kind of early on is that I'm not a morning person. I have 
developed into a morning person, but naturally I was more, much more of a night person. And so it was very hard to sort of wake up and, and, and be productive. I used to wake up early and then just check my phone and then look at my email. And I would be like 45 minutes later to an hour. I was like, what did I do? Why did I even wake up an hour early just to like check my phone and, and look at, you know, news? I was like, this just wasn't productive. So you got to wake up early and be productive. And there's there's many different ways to doing that. And, and certainly I can help out people if you got any questions about that. But um, yes, I mean, waking up early, being productive, getting those, those things done because living in LA and everything being sort of in a different time zone, you, you got to make these calls early in the morning because by the time two o'clock in the afternoon hits, everything's shut down. You can't contact the bank anymore. You can't contact maybe your property manager, whoever it is, you know, you can't contact. So you have to get stuff done early in the morning. Um, and so that's a that's a big sort of shift. And if you can make that, that shift happen, there's a lot of door, a lot more doors that kind of open up to you and, and a lot more, uh, a lot more ways that you can be productive, a lot more techniques that are involved, but certainly car carving out that space early in the morning. Um, anytime you can do it at lunch or, you know, make your phone calls at lunch too. And then pr probably after your job as well. But um, I would say that early morning is, is very helpful. Here you go. And Powell did an answer. How do you start a real estate business? Because that answer is going to be in multifamilymasters.com. Go and search this out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For so sure. the last question that I have is, again, you know, coming back to the point, 10,000 plus people across six locations, which has grown tremendously. And, you know, you're nurturing all these relationships. Again, coming back to the point that just, you know, during the COVID, you, you're still growing the company and personally closing all self-storage and, you know, looking to close more deals. And again, you know, a lot of things, different things happening, being on podcasts, just like this one, which I really appreciate, you know, coming on today and sharing all this wisdom, knowledge, tip strategies, but what is the legacy piece that you want to leave behind you? Yeah. You know, um, I kind of, when I, one of the, this opportunity that I'm doing right now with in self storage, um, some of my investors are my family and some of them are my younger nieces and nephews. And I'm really excited that first of all, that they are thinking about getting started and that they're, they want to come on, come on along board and get, get involved. And I want to help them propel them to like really treat this as not just like, Hey, I'm putting money in, in like a bank account or something, but like actually, Hey, come out with me and see what this is like, see what I'm doing, see how you can talk to other investors, see how you can talk to people and get involved with this, because this is a real good opportunity for you to, uh, I mean, I know a lot of people that would, take your place that, that would want to be involved in this, in this uh, self storage deal. So for me, like the legacy part of it is certainly with like helping like my friends and my family. I love seeing that. I love, I love having people just grow. Right. I mean, that's a, a super important part of it for me, myself personally, I always say that I'm striving to live that um, extraordinary life. Right. That's the whole sort of idea behind it is I, I'm striving to live that extraordinary life where, you know, I can kind of, you know, where, I could really, really kind of do whatever I want with my time, right? You know, and, and figure that my time is my time and I can kind of divvy it up accordingly to whatever I wanted to do it makes me happy or helps me grow at that particular time. So there's certainly a lot in life that I want to experience that I haven't got a chance to yet. And, um, and I want to have the, that opportunity to do so. That is awesome. That is very awesome. Again, going back to the fact, I mean, and this man is helping 10,000 plus people you know, to, to get their goals in line and, you know, to do the, the real estate business, how do you start to build a real estate business? And now he's going back to his family, you know, and, and helping them to do the same. So that is really awesome, you know? So, so it's, yeah. it's, the legacy is going to continue from there because again, the impact that you and the people who are, you know, running the multifamily masters, you know, uh, group and, and the meetup, I mean, they're making a tremendous impact and probably you, you sometimes just, you know, forget about that, you know? And yeah. it just comes back to you, I don't know, at some point and you're like, oh my God, these things are happening. Because sometimes yeah. we don't think we, we're adding a lot to, to what's happening, but I mean, you do, because you're making those small ripple effects across different, you know, states and now different countries, you know, yeah. and, that's, and that's a very great legacy and impact to have on people, you know? Thank you, thank you, very true, very true. Sometimes I do, I do forget about that, like think about how, how <laughs> yeah, big it is and everything wanted, gets, because. I just yeah. wanted to remind you, you know, that. <laughs> Appreciate it, thank you. That's no thank problem. You. Again, guys and girls, before we're going to go, one thing that I wanted to ask you, if you shared this episode with a, with a friend of yours who always talks about investing in real estate but never pulls the trigger, this is episode for that person. Uh, so make sure to share it with him or her because there's a lot of great strategies, techniques, 
mindset shifts, motivation. I mean, everything that you're looking for to get started. So make sure to pass it along. Again, Paolo, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I really enjoyed it today. I mean, there's a Martinez, lot of great awesome time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity as well. Thank you. Thank you again. So uh, guys, make sure to pass this episode along. And as always, I'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for watching.